please bow your heads with me as we pray. Our beloved Heavenly Father, it's once again with reverence that we come before your throne, knowing that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, knowing that we need divine wisdom in order to understand the meaning in your holy word of what the wrath of God is. We know you as a God of love. How is it then that the Bible describes the wrath of the Lamb and the wrath that is in the cup? I ask, Lord, that you will help us to understand this very important subject today, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to instruct us and to teach us. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of approaching your throne. And thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Once in a while when I travel and preach on Bible prophecy, I'll have somebody come up to me and say, Pastor, is it really that important to know all this stuff? Isn't it enough to just love Jesus and leave the study of the prophecies to the experts? Well, we're going to notice this evening that the third angel's message contains one of the most dire warnings in all of the Bible. It's a warning so strong that it appears to be very different than uh, what we find in the Gospels, for example. In fact, the third angel's message tells us that whoever worships the beast or his image or receives his mark or the number of his name will suffer the unmitigated and unmixed wrath of God. And for that reason, it's vitally important for us to know who the beast is and what the image is and what his mark is and what the number of his name is. Because if we don't know who the beast is, or who the image is, how are we ever going to protect ourselves from this power? In other words, it is vitally important for us to understand these things, so that we don't end up worshiping the beast and his image, and receiving the mark of the beast, and the number of his name. I'd like to read the third angel's message as we find it in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 9 through 11. Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11. And in our study today, we are going to only look at the first half of the third angel's message. And then in our next lecture, we're going to discuss uh, the issue of the fire and the brimstone. We'll touch upon it in our lecture today, but we'll do a full study of it in our next lecture. The third angel's message says this, Then a third angel followed them, that is the first two angels, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength, into the cup of his indignation. Now this is the portion that we're going to study today. The rest of the verse we're going to take a look at in our lecture, in our next lecture. I'm going to read it. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worships the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. You tell me, is it important for us to know who the beast is? Absolutely. Is it vital for us to know what the image to the beast is? Absolutely, because if we don't know, we probably will end up worshiping these powers. Now, I'd like to take you just for a moment to an event that is going to take place after the millennium. And a little later on in this lecture, we're going to come back to this point, but I want to introduce our subject by referring to 
an event that will take place after the millennium. You see folks, after the thousand years there will only be two groups. One group will be the saved, they are in the holy city. Outside the holy city are the lost. Not three groups, but two groups, the saved in the city and the lost outside the city. Now let me ask you this question. Those people who are in the city, were they sinners? Of course they were sinners. Those outside the city, were they sinners? Sure. In other words, you have sinners outside and you have sinners inside. And so the question is, what made the difference between the sinners inside and the sinners outside? Does God show partiality towards some while He doesn't favor others? Why are the saved in the city and why are the wicked outside the city? I'd like to read this verse, Revelation 22, actually two verses, Revelation 22 and verses 14 and 15, where these two groups are spoken of. It says there, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, which is the version that we've been using in our seminar, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. So there you have one group that do the commandments, other versions say wash their robes, they are inside the holy city and they have the right to eat from the tree of life. But then you have another group, verse 15, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. And so you have two groups, one inside the city and the other outside the city. Inside are those who keep God's commandments or wash their robes. Outside the city you have those who disobey God's holy commandments, because the list of things in verse 15 are things that violate principles that we find in the Ten Commandments. Now today we're going to talk about the wrath of God that will fall upon the wicked that will eventually be outside the holy city. And I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. And you're going to see why I started this lecture by referring to the two groups, two groups of sinners, one saved group of sinners and one lost group of sinners. What made the difference? Well, we just read that those inside keep the commandments, or they wash their robes, those outside practice these evil deeds in violation of God's commandments. But there's more to the story than this, because we're not saved by keeping God's commandments. Keeping God's commandments, we'll see, is a fruit of something else, of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. Here we find a description of the wrath of God that is going to be poured out upon the world shortly before the second coming of Jesus. It says there, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. The word complete in the Greek is full. In other words, the seven last plagues are the fullness of the revelation of God's wrath. And we're going to notice in the third angel's message that it says that, that the wrath of God is poured out without mixture. You see, at this point there's no blending of mercy in. It's pure justice when God's wrath is revealed. So what I want you to notice here in Revelation 15 verse 1 is that the plagues contain the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture or totally and completely. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1. The question is, where is this wrath of God contained? What is the container of the wrath of God? Well, notice Revelation 16 and verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out 
that's important, and pour out the what? The bowls, by the way, it's the word cups. It's the same word that's used in the Gospels that translate cup. That's important. And so it says, go and pour out the cups of what? Of the wrath of God on the earth. What is it that contains the wrath of God? Cups. You say, that's a strange place to have the wrath of God in cups, in seven bowls. By the way, the number seven represents totality and completeness. This is the total manifestation of the wrath of God. But now I want you to notice the third angel's message, once again, with which we began our lecture. Revelation 14 and verses 9 and 10. We've noticed that the seven last plagues are the outpouring of God's wrath, and this wrath is found in cups, and it's the totality of God's wrath. But now I want you to notice that the wicked have to do something with that wine that's in the cups. It says there in Revelation 14, verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also, now notice an, an, an added idea here, he himself shall also what? Drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So the cup contains what? It contains wine, and the wine is God's what? It's God's wrath, and the wicked must drink it, according to this. Remember these concepts, because we're going to come back to them. Verse 10, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength, without mixture in other words, full strength into the cup of his indignation. So are you catching the picture here? What does the cup contain? The wrath of God. And the wrath of God has to be what by the wicked? The wicked have to drink the wrath of God. Now I must tell you that the wrath of God does not come to an end until the wicked are destroyed after the millennium. In other words, the seven bowls, the seven plagues, are a fullness of the manifestation of the wrath of God, but that wrath is finally terminated with the destruction of the wicked after the millennium. And you say, how do we know that? Because in the third angel's message, it speaks about fire and brimstone falling from God out of heaven. And that is the final manifestation of the wrath of God. So the plagues, we might say, are the first installment of the fullness of the wrath of God, and it culminates eventually in the destruction of the wicked by fire after the millennium. Because the third angel's message, as we read, speaks about fire and brimstone falling from heaven upon the wicked. Now let's go to Psalm 11 and verse 6. Psalm 11 and verse 6, I want to show you that there's a connection between the cup and the pouring out of fire. And by the way, we're going to discuss this more fully in our next lecture. We're going to talk about the fire and brimstone and burning forever and ever, etc., which has been greatly misunderstood by the Christian world. Psalm 11 and verse 6. Notice this. Upon the wicked, he will what? Rain, coals, fire, and what? And brimstone, and a burning wind shall the, be the portion of their cup. So let me ask you, does the cup contain fire and brimstone? It most certainly does. Now, we must understand then that the seven last plagues are the fullness of the manifestation of the wrath of God, which means without any mixture of mercy, but the last stage of the outpouring of the wrath of God takes place after the thousand years when fire and brimstone destroys the wicked. That is the final manifestation of the wrath of God. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 22. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22. In Scripture, the wrath of God is linked with fire. And, uh, you know, even today we use metaphors. We use uh, expressions that connect 
wrath with warmth or with something that's hot. For example, we say, that guy's got a hot temper. Or we say, his temper flared up. Or we say, he's hot-headed. Or when we get angry, we say, that burns me up. In other words, the wrath of God is linked with the idea of fire. But let me explain something. The wrath of God is not like our anger or our wrath. You know, we get angry over things because our precious little self is offended. But with God, the wrath of God is the fact that God and His holiness cannot coexist with sin. Righteousness and holiness cannot be in the same room with sin. And therefore the wrath of God is the outpouring of the punishment of God upon those who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord because they chose to hang on to sin. And God and sin cannot coexist because God is a holy God. It's kind of like Jesus. You remember he was in the uh, temple one time and uh, uh, there were some people that were accusing him of Sabbath breaking because he healed a man with, uh, with a withered hand. You might remember that. It's Mark 3, verses 1 through 6. The only time in the New Testament where we find the word anger connected with Jesus is in that story. When he saw the hardness of their hearts, the Bible says that he was angry. Now, is that the same kind of anger that we have? Absolutely not. It's what we call righteous indignation. In other words, when somebody's doing something that is totally contrary to what we know is right and true and good, we're filled with righteous indignation. That is the sense in which the wrath of God is to be understood. Now notice Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22. For a fire is kindled in my anger. Sounds kind of strange for God, doesn't it? A fire is kindled in my anger. So God's wrath has to do with fire once again. And shall burn to the lowest hell. It shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Once again, is the wrath of God connected with fire? It most certainly is. That is the final stage of the manifestation of the wrath of God. And by the way, do you know that the final thing that has to do with the wrath of God is what the Bible calls the second death? Go with me to Revelation chapter 20 and verses 14 and 15. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 14 and 15. The lake of fire where there is brimstone and fire is the final manifestation and fulfillment of the third angel's message. Notice what it says there. This is after the millennium. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the what? This is the second death. So what is the final manifestation of the wrath of God? It is called what? The second death in the lake of fire. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast where? Was cast into the lake of fire. Now we need to ask ourselves the question. Why will the wicked suffer such a terrible manifestation of the wrath of God. For how many people did Jesus die? Did Jesus die only for the, those who are found finally inside the holy city? Absolutely not. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He is the propitiation not for, only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So did Jesus die to save all of the people that are also outside the holy city? Absolutely. The question is, why weren't they saved? Why were those inside saved, whereas those outside were not saved? In order to understand this, we have to go back and analyze the experience of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because much of the terminology that we've noticed at the beginning of our study today is used in connection with the passion of Christ. A few years ago, probably uh, all of you will remember, Mel Gibson came out with his movie, The Passion of the Christ. You know, it brought in hundreds of millions of dollars. 
And those who saw it say that the movie majored in the brutal physical punishment that was meted out upon Jesus Christ. I mean, savagely beaten time after time after time until the blood uh, just was in pools on the ground. In other words, that movie emphasized the tremendous physical sufferings of Jesus, the physical agony. But do you know what? It was not the physical agony of Jesus that caused him the greatest pain. In fact, I believe that Jesus Christ could hardly feel the physical pain because of the spiritual anguish that he was suffering. And you say, what do you mean by the spiritual anguish? Well, let's study about it in the Gospels. Matthew 26 and verse 38. Matthew 26 and verse 38. Here Jesus is with his disciples. Uh, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says to his disciples the following words. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Not, notice, not only sorrowful is his soul, but exceedingly sorrowful. He says, even to what? Even to death. In other words, he had so much sorrow that apparently it was going to cause his what? His death. And so he says to the disciples, stay here and watch with me. And what do they do? They go to sleep. And later on, what do they do? They all forsake him. And so Jesus is by himself. Now, there's a book that I love. Some of you probably have heard about it, if not most of you. It's uh, the book, The Desire of Ages. There are two chapters in this book that I would like to recommend. You know, there's no way that you can read these chapters and uh, not have t your eyes tear up. Uh, one of those chapters is titled Gethsemane, and the other one is titled Calvary. You know, this book... Uh, is the most loved biography of Christ in the Library of Congress. They did a survey a few years ago. They discovered that over and above, The Desire of Ages was the favorite book on the life of Jesus Christ. On page 685, we find this remarkable statement about Jesus and this intense sorrow that he felt. When in conflict with men, who were inspired by the very spirit of Satan, he, that is Jesus, could say, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Why hadn't the Father left him alone? Because Jesus always did what, what? What pleased the Father. And then she remarks, But now he seemed to be shut out, from the light of God's sustaining presence. He was, now he was numbered with the transgressors. The guilt of fallen humanity he must bear. Upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him. So great is the weight of guilt which he must bear that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Feeling how terrible is, now notice this, feeling how terrible the wrath of God is, the wrath of God against transgression. He exclaims, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Why was Jesus sorrowful? Because he sensed the wrath of God falling upon him. Notice Matthew 26. We'll read verses 39, 42, and 44. Jesus is in the garden, and he's, and he's uh, kneeling, and he's praying to his Father. He's pleading with his Father. By the way, this is before anybody even laid one finger on him. Notice Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, now don't miss this point, if it is possible, let this, what? This cup pass from me. Nevertheless, 
not as I will, but as you will. Notice what we find in verse 42. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father! Now you're going to have an, an added element. Oh, my Father! If this cup cannot pass away from me unless I what? Drink it! Do you have the same elements that we found in the third angel's message? Absolutely. And in the outpouring of the seven last plagues? Yes. So he says, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And verse 44 says, So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Let me ask you, who gave Jesus that cup to drink? In Revelation it says that the cup contains the wrath of whom? The wrath of God. The question is, who gave that cup that Jesus needed to drink? Notice John chapter 18 and verse 11. John chapter 18 and verse 11. This is when Peter took out his sword and cut off the servant's ear. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Who gave Jesus the cup? His Father gave him the cup. You say, that's impossible, Pastor Boy. You mean to say that the cup that contained the wine of God's wrath, Jesus had to drink that cup, and it was given to him by his very own Father. That's what Scripture says. No wonder when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, an angel had to come and strengthen Jesus, or else he probably would have died because his, he said, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. Let's read about it in Luke chapter 22 and verses 43 and 44. Luke 22, 43 and 40, 44. It says there, Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Notice, then his sweat became like great drops of what? Of blood falling down to the ground. How many of you have ever seen anybody sweat blood? How much agony must you have, how much suffering must you have in order to sweat Blood instead of water. And listen, folks, this is before one single person laid a finger on Jesus Christ. He's already sweating blood. He's already suffering agony long before anybody came and started beating him. In other words, his agony was not agony of body. His agony was primarily agony of soul. In the book God's Amazing Grace, page 168, we find this statement, human nature would then and there have died under the horror of the sense of sin had not an angel from heaven strengthened him to bear the agony. He would have died in the garden without anyone laying one finger upon him. In other words, the agony of Jesus did not have to do with the crown of thorns and with the beating on his back and with all of his physical suffering. It had to do with extreme spiritual anguish because his father had given him the cup of his wrath and Jesus had to drink this cup. You know, we catch a glimpse into the feelings of Jesus in a prophecy that was given about a thousand years before Jesus was even born. Psalm 22 and verses 1 and 2. In fact, we have the very words that Jesus spoke on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm not silent, he says, I cry out and you don't listen. Why, Father, have you forsaken me? Do you know why? Because Jesus was drinking the cup of the wrath of God. Because Jesus, as we'll notice, was bearing the sins of the whole world upon himself. I'd like to read another couple of statements from this magnificent book, 
Desire of Ages from the chapter on Gethsemane. Notice this statement. This is found on page 686. He felt that by sin he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. The agony, this agony, he must not exert his divine power to escape. As man he must suffer the consequences of Adam's sin. As man he must endure the what? The wrath of God against transgression. On page 686, the same page, it says, as the substitute and surety for sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw what justice meant. Hitherto he had been an intercessor for others. You know, Jesus interceded for other people all during his ministry. But now the author says, now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. Nobody to intercede before the Father for him because he was bearing the sin of the world. I want to read just one final statement. This is found on page, uh, uh, let me just find it here, 693 of Desire of Ages. It says, in this awful crisis, when everything was at stake, when the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, notice the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, light sh shone forth, and the stormy darkness of the crisis hour, and the mighty angel who stands in God's presence, occupying the position from which Satan fell, came to the side of Christ. The angel came not to take the cup, see the reference to the cup, came not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to what? To drink it with the Father's assurance, with the assurance of the Father's love. Many years later, the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews about the anguish of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's found in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was, was heard because of his godly fear. Notice the expressions, prayers, supplications, vehement cries, tears. It speaks about the anguish that Jesus felt in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was drinking the cup of the wrath of his own father. You know what made it especially difficult for Jesus? Is the fact that all during his ministry he had felt an intimate closeness with his father. As it says in John chapter 8 and verse 29, Jesus spoke these words during his ministry. He said, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. He says, I'm not alone. My Father is always with, with me because I do what pleases him. But now, in the agony of Gethsemane, Jesus is saying, my Father has left me alone. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course the question comes, why was Jesus drinking the cup of the wrath of God? Folks, it was because Jesus was suffering the just punishment that all of us deserve. I want to read several statements from Scripture where, where this fact is brought out that the cup that Jesus drank, the cup of the wrath of God, of His Father, the justice of His Father, actually means that Jesus was bearing the sins of the whole world upon His shoulders. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Galatians 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let me ask you, is the law bad? Many Christians think that the law is bad. Even though the Apostle Paul said that the law is holy and just and what? Holy and just and good. Who's bad? We are. Why does the law curse us? Because we're sinners. The law says, if you live in harmony with my principles, I bless you. If you violate my principles, the curse will fall upon you. The law is not bad. It's sin that is bad. And so it says, Christ has redeemed us 
from the curse of the law. How did Jesus do this? How did he redeem the world from the curse of the law? It says, having become a what? Having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Do you know where that uh, expression, that phrase comes from? Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It actually comes from Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. And I'm just going to mention this. It's not in your list of texts. You know, the enemies of Israel, uh, when they were captured, they were slain and they were hung on trees outside the encampment of Israel. And they were considered cursed and forsaken by God. And after they were dead, actually they were, they were taken down from, from the... Uh, they weren't crosses, they were actually stakes of wood. They were taken down at sundown, and they were placed in a cave, and stones were placed at the entrance to the cave. Now, does that sound familiar? Let me ask you, Jesus Christ, was he looked upon as cursed by God? Absolutely he was. When was his body removed from the cross? Right around when the sun was going to what? To set. And he was hung where? He was hung on a tree. And where was he buried? He was placed in a cave. And what was placed in front of the, cave, the entrance to the cave? A stone was placed by the entrance of the cave. In other words, this punishment was the punishment for the worst sinners against Israel. And Jesus suffered the worst kind of humiliation and punishment for the human race because he bore the sin of the whole world. You know, there are people in the world today who have committed, actually they don't live today, but they lived in the world, and they committed suicide because they had such a guilty conscience. Now can you imagine what it would be like to bear upon yourself the guilt of every sin that has been committed is being committed or will be committed in human history? Actually, that is what crushed out the life of Jesus. That's what broke his heart. Jesus did not die of the wounds that he received. Even the soldier was surprised when he came. The, the centurion came and found him dead, and he thrust a spear through his side. He was surprised that he, that, that he wasn't dead because the thieves were still alive. Because Jesus did not buy, die from his physical wounds. Jesus died of a broken heart because his father, at least he felt, had forsaken him. He could not see the reconciling face of his father because he was bearing the guilt of the whole human race. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he, that is, this talk about God the Father, for he made him, that is, God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be what? To be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Who made Jesus sin? God the Father made Jesus sin, that we might be found what? That we might be found the righteousness of God in him. I want you also to notice uh, the following statement that we find in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. You know, it describes vividly why Jesus was suffering this intense agony, what it meant that he was drinking the cup of God's wrath. It says there, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by whom? By God, who smote Jesus? His own father. You say, why is that? Why did he get the cup of his father's wrath? He was holy and righteous. He always did what, his, what pleased his father. Why did that happen to Jesus? Because Jesus was taking our place. Notice, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And now notice the last part of verse 6. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Who put on Jesus the iniquity? The Father did. Who gave him the cup? The Father did. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Do you think the Father suffered as well as Jesus? Folks, you know, sometimes we talk about the sufferings of Jesus, but sometimes I wonder if the suffering of God the Father was not even greater than the suffering of Jesus Christ because both of them were separated from one another because Jesus was bearing the sin of the world. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 is a beautiful verse. It says, He who did not spare his own son. God did what? He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up. Who delivered him up? The Father. But delivered him up. Why? For us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Let me ask you, does God the Father love us as much as he loves Jesus? That's what this verse is saying. He did not spare his own son because he loved us as much as he loved Jesus. Or else he would not have been willing to give up Jesus, his son. And so this is comforting to know that he was willing to go through this intense agony and suffering because he wanted us to be saved in his kingdom. He loves us as much as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate this point. I just arrived in Fresno um, about going on 13 and a half years ago. And uh, one evening, one Wednesday night, we had prayer meeting and we sang and, you know, we studied scripture and we gave testimonies, a fantastic experience. And uh, after the prayer meeting, I was all pumped up and excited. And so I got in the car and I went up here uh, to Clinton and I turned right on Clinton and then I turned left on First Street. And uh, I was just, I was in the, walking in the clouds. I was so excited about what had happened at prayer meeting. And I didn't notice that uh, my speedometer marked 50 miles an hour. And uh, you, actually 55 miles an hour, and it's a 40 mi mile per hour zone. And um, I was very, very elevated until I saw that blue and red light behind my car. And by the way, this is the only time that I've been stopped here in Fresno in 13 and a half years. And uh, the policeman got out of his car, he came to the window, said, could I have your license, please? So I took out, you know, my wallet and I couldn't, my license wasn't in there. I'd taken it out for some reason. So I says, well, could I have your registration? I said, yeah, I'll give you the registration. So I looked in the glove compartment above the visor, couldn't find my registration. So he says, well, <laughs> do you have proof of insurance? I say, well, let me look. And so I looked, and I couldn't find proof of insurance either. And uh, so he says, uh, what's your name? I said, my name is Stephen Bohr. And uh, he said, what is your profession? And you know what? I was kind of embarrassed. Uh, I, I actually said, well, you know, I'm, I'm pastor of the church right around the corner, Fresno Central Church. And he said, well, uh, let me go back to my car and, you know, look in the computer and check things out. So he was there for a few minutes, and then he came back to the window, and he said, uh, Pastor Bohr, everything checks out. I know you have a license, and I know that you're registered, and I know that you have insurance, <laughs> because it's all in the computer. And I was feeling pretty good. I said, well, but the ticket is coming. And so he looked at me, and he said, you know, uh, you as a pastor sh of all people should uh, obey the laws of Caesar. And I said, you know, I really know that, but I, was in, I explained to him, I was in prayer meeting, you know, we had testimonies, we sang and we studied scripture, and I was just pumped up, I just got carried away, I didn't even notice. Uh, and so he looked at me and he said, you know, I, I can tell that uh, this isn't a thing that you regularly do, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you go, but be more careful next time. Now let me ask you, did that policeman do the right thing? No, he did not do the right thing. You say, well, you got off the hook. Yes, I got off the hook, but he didn't do the right thing. Because I had violated the law, and the justice of the law demanded that I pay the fine. I'm thankful I didn't have to. But if he had done his job, he would have given me the ticket. You know what would have been even better? If he'd come to the window and said, Pastor Bohr, you know, the law says that if you go 15 miles an hour over the speed limit, uh, you have to pay 
such and such a fine. And uh, you know, so, so you're liable. But he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to go down to the um, police station. I'm going to go to the judge. And I'm going to pay this ticket myself. You say, fat chance. Of course, that wouldn't happen in real life. But let me ask you, if he went down, if he went to court, to the judge, and he paid my ticket, would the justice of the law be sustained? Yes, because the fine is what? Pay. But at the same time, would mercy be shown? Yes, because he paid the fine so that I did not have to what? So that I did not have to pay it. That's exactly what happened with Jesus. You see, we all should die. We all should be punished with the sentence of death. But Jesus paid the death that we should suffer. And because He paid the death that we should suffer, justice is satisfied, the demands of the law are satisfied, but at the same time His mercy is shown because He suffered the penalty so that I don't have to suffer it. You all know the verse that we have, the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3 and verse 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That includes everyone, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But there's a second half of the verse. And sometimes people forget what that second half of the verse says. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever what? that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So let me ask you, did He die to save everyone? Did He pay everyone's debt? He mo well, He didn't pay everyone's debt, but He made provision to pay everyone's debt. Now, I go back to the original question that we began our lecture with. Why do you have a group in the holy city who were sinners, but they're saved, and you ha have another group of sinners outside the holy city that eventually will be destroyed by fire and brimstone. What made the difference? Folks, the made, what made the difference is simply that the group who are in the holy city received or accepted the gift that Jesus purchased at the pr price of His own blood. You see, Jesus, by shedding His blood, paid an infinite price. He paid enough to save every single person on planet earth. But I have to receive or accept that gift. And if I don't accept that gift, then I am still in my sins and I must suffer death. So we get back to those individuals who are outside the holy city who are going to finally suffer the ultimate punishment of the wrath of God. Why are they going to suffer this punishment? Did Jesus suffer this punishment in their place? He most certainly did. He suffered the wrath of God. He paid the penalty of their sin. But what did they do? They refused to accept the payment that Jesus made. I want to go to Revelation chapter 20 and verses 7 through 9. Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 9. This is speaking about after the millennium when the wicked are gathered around the holy city of the New Jerusalem. Those who rejected the payment that Jesus Christ offered. It says in verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And now notice, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Is that what we find in the third angel's message? Fire falling from heaven, fire and brimstone, and devouring the wicked? Absolutely. This is the final manifestation of the wrath of God in the third angel's message. Now where does this language come from? where, you know, you have the nations of all of the world coming from the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Where does this come from? It actually comes from Ezekiel chapter 39. So let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 39 and verses 17 through 19. Ezekiel 39 and verses 17 through 19. And there's a very important point that I want to underline here. 
You remember that in the sanctuary there was a sacrificial service, right? Bulls and goats and lambs, different kinds of animals were sacrificed. Why were they sacrificed? They pointed forward to the death of Jesus Christ for sin, right? The fact that he was going to suffer the punishment of sinners. Now I want you to notice carefully what it says here. And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come. Gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal. What is God going to do here? A what? A sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. Is this a sacrifice? By the way, this is the same word that is used in the book of Leviticus for the sacrifices of the sanctuary. A great sacrificial meal, again it says, on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, and now notice the animals that are mentioned, of rams and lambs, of goats and bulls. What kinds of animals were these? Sacrificial animals. All of them fatlings of Basham. You shall eat fat till you are full, and drink blood till you are drunk at meal, which I am what? Which I am sacrificing for you. Is the death of the wicked portrayed as a sacrifice, as a sanctuary sacrifice? It most certainly is. And you say, why is it portrayed as sacrificial animals? Let me tell you. There's actually two ways that your sins can be taken care of. The first way is if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and therefore accept the payment that He made for your sins. Let me ask you, if you receive Jesus, are your sins paid for? They most certainly are paid for, but you didn't have to pay for them. He was sacrificed instead of you. But I ask you, is there another way of paying the penalty of sin? Of course there is. What is the other way? That I suffer death. Are you understanding why sacrificial animals are used here? It's because the wicked did not accept the sacrifice of Christ, therefore they have to pay the debt for their own sins. You see, when Jesus, when Jesus died, He deposited enough currency, if you please, in the bank of the universe to save every single human being. But we have to come and we have to make the withdrawal. And if we don't make the withdrawal, then His payment will do us no good. And therefore, we must pay for our sins with our own death. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And Ezekiel 39 is talking about this group of people outside the Holy City because Ezekiel 38 and 39 are talking about Gog and Magog, the same context of Revelation 20 verses 7 through 9. So my question is, why were those outside the city lost? Because they rejected Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and they chose rather to worship whom? The beast, his image, and to receive the mark of the beast and the number of his name. So is receiving Jesus Christ a matter of life and death? It most certainly is. You see, either Jesus suffered the wrath of God in my place, or I will have to suffer the wrath of God myself. Notice once again Revelation chapter 20 verses 14 and 15, the final manifestation of the wrath of God. It says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is what? The second death. You know what the second death is? The second death is that death from which there is no resurrection. Did Jesus suffer the second death? Don't miss the next exciting episode because we're going to address that issue. Did Jesus suffer second death? If he did suffer second death, why is he not separated from God today? Why did he see his father's face again? A very important question, which we'll address in our next lecture. Next lecture. But I want you to notice, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found where? written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Whose book is this, the book of life? Notice Revelation 13 and verse 8. 
It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, that is, worship the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of life of whom? Of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Who is written in the book of the Lamb? The saved. And when was that Lamb slain? It says here from the foundation of the world. The plan was laid in eternity, but it was implemented when Jesus Christ came to this earth. And so who is it, folks, who is going to drink the cup of the wine of the wrath of God? What a waste. Nobody in this world really has to drink the cup of the wrath of God, of the wine of the wrath of God, because Jesus already drank it. What a waste that someone would have to drink that cup of wrath themselves when Jesus already drank it. The Bible tells us that in the last days, those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark and the number of his name will drink the cup of the unmitigated wrath of God. And after the millennium, their destruction will be sure and final. So the big question is, have we repented of sin and confessed our sin? Have we chosen Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord instead of the beast? Have we committed our lives without any reservation to Jesus Christ and only to Him? You see, the issue at the end time will be Christ or the beast. And the question is, who of these two will we worship?